Welcome to the Angie Creates podcast. I'm your host Angie Wang. In this podcast, I interview curious humans on how they become the most alive versions of themselves through creative expressions like movement, art, and writing. 欢迎来到 Angie Creates， 我是你的主持人安吉。在这个节目呢，我喜欢和来宾们聊聊关于数位游牧、写作、艺术和身体训练的不同主题，探索如何活出最精彩的人生。Today, my guest is Rachelle Moses. Rachelle is currently pursuing her PhD in criminal justice. She is also a digital artist, a powerlifter, a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. She worked as a domestic violence victim advocate and absolutely loved the prevention and education work she did. She just actually moved to Austin last week, and last year she realized that going to traditional route and working in academia wasn't what she really wanted to do. So she started exploring the online creator space. She has been writing a weekly online newsletter called Women Empowerment for almost a year. Very impressive. Her writing focuses on empowering women and advocating for those who can advocate for themselves. Welcome to the podcast, Rachelle. Hello, thanks. I'm excited to be here. Now, I, as I told you before, we're going to be really in the flow、mm-hmm. for this conversation. When I was doing the inter, when I was doing the introduction, what what parts of your self introduction, what part of your introduction feel most alive for you to talk about right now? I think I would have to say like the the powerlifting and the jujitsu and pivoting out of academia and into online creator space, because those are all points of major transition,、mm-hmm. but also things that younger me would have never thought I would ever、mm-hmm. think of doing. I'm a very shy and introverted person, and I always have been. I was never one to be like in the spotlight or want to be in the center of attention, but. All three of those things, like powerlifting and jujitsu and online creator, they're all like strong, and just you kind of have to fully be in it. And people watch you do jujitsu, especially when you compete, and people are paying attention to what I write online and、mm-hmm. what I put online now. And it's just things that I never expected myself to do. I expected myself to take on a more Quiet role in life, and that's not the direction I ended up going at all.、Mm-hmm. Do you really? Okay, so do you feel it's more like a surprise or more like alignment now? Kind of both.、Um, I'm surprised by it, just looking at how I've been my whole life and how quiet and reserved I've been my whole life. But also, I feel like I'm in a very good space. Like I feel the most excited and the most exhilarated, and ready to take on these new adventures more than like I thought I used to be excited about what I was doing, and I thought that the things that I was doing is what I wanted to do with life. But now that I've started trying these other things, um, I didn't realize that this was the level of excitement that I needed、mm-hmm. to be looking for.、Mm-hmm. Okay, why don't we start with powerlifting first? Then, okay.、Um, the reason why I want to start is because I think I have a very similar path,、mm-hmm. and I read in your writing before about why people should love jujitsu, and one of the requirement is. Wait, I was talking about powerlifting, but then we go back to jujitsu. <laughs> I mean, they're the same kind of mentality for both. So,、uh-huh. you say one of the requirement is so one of the non requirement is you don't have to be like an athlete、mm-hmm. to be a. Jujitsu practitioner, and then you talk about before when you were a kid, you thought that you were not the athletic, athletic kind, and I think like that's what draw me into lifting at the beginning too. When I was a kid, I also have the narrative that I'm not good at sports, especially I remember being like being fit or doing any sort of sport is considered、mm-hmm. a low, a low. How do we like?、Um, That people don't appreciate it about being a female for that,、mm-hmm. and my mom always told me, "Oh, you have to stop lifting, otherwise you'll never have any boyfriends." <laughs> and I remember when I was a kid, I would every time in PT class, I'm always, I'm always just, 
on the side and talking、mm-hmm. to girls and just like gossiping. And whenever I was called by the by the PE teacher to go play, I was just oh god again. Why do I have to be in the sun? Because in Taiwan we don't like to get tan. We think getting tan is like the worst quality a female can have.、Mm-hmm. And so when I started to get started studying in the states and then getting to lifting, I found out it's such an empowerment for me、mm-hmm. as a tiny female Asian to be able to lift. And I got so into that, and I found out actually with a coach, with someone who's just next to you, telling you how to do a movement properly and doing progressive overload,、mm-hmm. it's possible to be in the sport and very good at it. As long as you have someone to tell you how to do it,、mm-hmm. so it's about like following a methodology and then following and building up that technique. It's so it's it kind of like dawned on me like shit. I wasn't actually really bad at sport. It's just like I am so upset with the narrative that I shouldn't do sport, and we also don't have the opportunity of having someone by us coaching us through step step by step、mm-hmm. to be good at it. Yeah, the environment is so important because, like, there are so many times throughout my life that I've walked into a gym with the intention of getting into shape and getting healthier, and I would get nervous because I didn't know how to use any of the equipment. I didn't know what specific exercises were good for what I was trying to accomplish. So I would end up walking on a treadmill for fifteen, twenty minutes, and then leaving and going home. But once I found Derby City in Louisville, Kentucky, before we moved here. Um, the coaches there—that's where I did jujitsu and lifting.、Um, it, they had both at that gym, and once I started at that gym, just the environment and the community that the owners created there is everything that I had been missing.、Uh, for powerlifting, I had an amazing coach who basically he would just show me how to do a lift, and I would do it. Just how he showed me to. If he needed to correct something, he would correct it really quick. And I'm a really good student, so it wasn't hard for him to correct what needed to be corrected, and it wasn't hard for me to take that instruction. And it got to a point where I loved going on Monday nights because that's when all of the super big, muscular buff guys that are like lifting 500 pounds. We're lifting, and they're all so encouraging, like cheering me on when I'm going for a new PR or helping me when I don't fully understand a lift. And my coach wasn't there. That that didn't scare me anymore because anyone there was super supportive and super encouraging. And the same was true for jujitsu. I had tried gyms in the past, and I just wasn't super excited about the sport. But then at Derby City, everyone there was super encouraging and very supportive, and Willing to help if I didn't understand something, and it's just the environment of a gym is crucial, and finding your people is super important, and understanding that if this gym and this coach doesn't work, it's okay to try other ones. It's okay、mm-hmm. to move on until like you're the one that is trying to improve yourself, right? So finding that environment that works for you because that gym might not be what someone else is looking for. So just finding the gym that works best for you and is what you are looking for is so important to your success as a lifter. Because I'm not an athletic human. Like I failed eighth grade gym because I refused to change for class. <laughs>、um, so I never wanted to participate in sports. I quit ballet. I quit swimming. I quit all of the sports my mom tried to get me into, and I've been overweight most of my life. But Lifting, I'm good at. I'm good at powerlifting. I can deadlift no problem. Jujitsu, I play the sport how it works for my body because jujitsu is very individualized, and you can do the sport however you need to and however your body needs you to. So just finding those things that are exactly what you need and how you need them to be.、Mm-hmm. I think you mentioned one thing super important. That you you wanted going to at a time where there will be other dudes lifting、mm-hmm. super heavy and also cheering for you. And I think for me, I I was just also at first I was lifting just for shapes, and but I met this group of people where I just enjoy hanging out and lifting with、mm-hmm. them so much, and they they cheer for me, they encourage me to go high to go on a higher goal when I want to give up, and that is so important for me because if it just I remember a professor said to me she worked she worked on a project of like、um, researching into the gender space in gyms in sports, and then she t- she said that a lot of times 
who can use what spaces in the gym is already predetermined. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like who can use the squat machine, who can use the free weight, who is who is considered legitimate, quote unquote, to be using whatever equipment is in the gym. Mm -hmm. And so that made that made people who are not qualified in the societal expectation to be in that area scared as hell to go into that area, mm -hmm. and that reinforced them to be only be using a certain type of machine. And then so it's like a vicious cycle. And for me, yes, there are times where I will intentionally go into the gym, do things that that a, a tiny, skinny Asian girl shouldn't be doing, just to be re a rebellious. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be going on that road for so long if I don't, I, I, if I never find the group of people mm -hmm. that supported me, and even helping me like get past that self doubt. Because there was one time I was trying to increase my deadlift PR. And I had tried the lift once and couldn't get the bar up. I tried the lift twice. I couldn't get the bar up. So I walked over to one of the guys at the gym. He's the MMA coach there, um, Ben. And I was like, hey, Ben, I'm trying to get this deadlift PR up. I failed twice, but I really think I can do it. Can you be my hype person? Can you just push me through that lift? And he turned on a highly energetic song and was just in my corner and I was able to successfully get that PR up and he didn't even bat an eye he didn't even like think twice about helping me he was just like yeah let's do it and so just finding your people will help you get to where you want to go mm -hmm. and you mentioned finding a coach that is suitable for you mm -hmm. I think that one is super important too because I feel like people didn't realize how or people realize, but it verbalized that how lifting can be such a vulnerable experience mm -hmm. too. Because like, okay, one way you're trying to feed your ego and you're trying to be confident, but also you are, if you hire a coach, you basically, no matter who you are, you're a lawyer, you are like a CEO, or you are a teenager, you are exposing what you are not good at to another person. Mm -hmm. And you are literally giving your body to someone else. And I see a lot of like high high status people going to the gym and we are just we're the same. We're we're building from the ground and then we are trying to overcome that discomfort, trying to over trying to know ourselves, trying to accept that it's a vulnerable space to mm -hmm. be in. And if you find a coach, which we can later <laughs> connect it to the abusive relationship that I want to talk about later. Yeah. If you find a coach that is very abusive, that is that it's just not gonna work. And I remember my first coach, but my first one on one personal trainer I hired was a big name in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize her her co his coaching style is actually a little bit abusive. Mm -hmm. Like if you try to do something and then he will be like smirking and say, Oh, this is all you can do. And then or like this just like he was never proud of me. And he never feel made me feel like I should be confident or be proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And I I took it for granted. I thought I was a bad student. I just want to keep impressing him mm -hmm. until I ran out of money. So I have to stop hiring personal trainer for a while. And then, um, so that's the first trainer I hired. And then I like I didn't hire many other trainers. I just like solo practicing for myself. And then I had injuries, and we started like nomading around, which you you know part of the story. But I wanted to tell. Well, I wanted to like share the story of me later was in Mexico mm -hmm. and I met this movement community which is the Ido Portal it's an Israeli type of movement community and I was just shocked by how they treat their their students I wouldn't tell clients because I feel like they don't treat them as like monetary income they treat mm -hmm. them as human as part of the friend the family a community every time we met it's a big hug and then it's only like cheering about like how good we are and how how much improvement we made. Mm -hmm. And then we play, we, we lived and then we play movement in a way that it's just not, it's not a competition. We know it's not a competition in between us. And we just like so happy when we ever see the other person improve. And then we play with kids together. And that make adults super humble too, mm -hmm. because you know, kids, they can be really lifting super heavy and they're so mobile, so agile. And so that that totally just made me realize I was looking for a coaching relationship like this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And like, I want someone to be proud of me. And I want to be working out in a community where we are cheering for each other mm -hmm. instead of thinking the other person is our, our competitor. Yeah, there's a really big difference between a coach who 
pushes you to be better than you were the day before and push you to the limits they know that you can reach. And a coach that constantly puts you down, like you said, saying that's all you can do. And that's not the way a coach should be. A coach should be supportive, but push you to reach those limits that they can see inside you. Because we all think that we're not as good as we can be. It's always external opinions and it's always other people around us in our circle that can see where we can get to. They always think that we can get further than we can. And there's such a difference in a supportive yet um, just a supportive coach that pushes you and an abusive coach. And it's it's really hard to find that line. Mm -hmm. um, I I want to talk about jujitsu. Mm -hmm. So you said that your dream offer both sports in a gym, but what made you interested in jujitsu and wanted to try it in the first place? Please, uh, Corey, my boyfriend. <laughs> um, he was, I believe, a blue belt. Went so in jujitsu, the belt ranks you start as a white belt, and then it's usually two to three ish years between each belt level, depending on your gym and how you're training, but then it goes, you start at white and then it's a blue belt, then a purple belt, then a brown belt and a black belt. There are a couple other belts past black belt, but it's very hard to achieve those. And it's a small percentage of the population that actually gets to that point. But I met Corey and he was a blue belt and he told me I should try out this sport because he thought it'd be something that I could get into. And I tried it. I trained for about eight months and I just wasn't really invested in it. I had a lot of like chronic pain stuff going on that I hadn't figured out yet. So I wasn't having fun when I did it. Um, but then I took a few years off. I got the chronic pain stuff figured out. And so I tried again when we moved to Kentucky and I immediately fell in love. I realized that my body, even though it's not what society says is in shape. It's not like I'm not a thin person. I'm not athletic, as I said before, but I can still do jujitsu and I can still do it well. And so I immediately fell in love with it. Plus it just the mentality of jujitsu is like it's so empowering. Um, a lot of women start training jujitsu for the self self-defense aspect um, to help build their confidence when they're walking down the street by themselves or recovering from an abusive relationship or something like that. And it just really helps build that self-confidence. Like one, I'm capable of doing things that I didn't think I was capable of doing, but two, if need be, I could protect myself and I just never quit. Mm hmm. I remember going on like a jujitsu, like a self-defense workshop mm -hmm. using jujitsu. Um, in Mexico, and the coach was telling me that for some for some women, they're there to learn self defense because what if, and there are a lot of things that could happen mm -hmm. if you walk on the beach at night. And some women really go went there because they were victims mm -hmm. of sexual violence. And I w I was really shocked actually. But um, could you tell tell us more about? What is jujitsu? Because I have, I mean, I have one workshop experience, and I feel like I still, I still couldn't quite comprehend. I, I know I see people like wrestling with each other, mm -hmm. but is it more about the technique, or is it more about wh what is it? Technique's a really big part of it. So jujitsu was originally created uh, by the Gracie family, and one of the Gracie family members, he was a smaller framed individual. He was shorter. He was thinner. He had shorter limbs. And so he was trying this sport, but it was interesting because he wasn't a size that you would think would be successful in a combat sport. So Brazilian jiu-jitsu really became about the smaller opponent being able to use leverage and timing and technique to overpower a bigger, stronger opponent on the ground. Now, jiu-jitsu involves takedown techniques to go from standing to the ground, but a lot of jiu-jitsu happens on the ground. Basically, if you watch a UFC fight, if they're on the ground doing things other than striking, because there's no striking in jiu-jitsu, but if they're on the ground, they're more than likely doing jiu-jitsu. Um, so it's all about 
the smaller person being able to overpower a bigger opponent using those things like timing and technique. So it's really beneficial to women because women tend to be smaller framed and less physically strong, just physiologically than males. So it's really good for women to learn jujitsu because they're able to learn that leverage, learn that timing and learn that technique to it's a lot of like joint manipulation and weight distribution, like knocking your opponent off balance and things like that. So it's mainly built for the smaller person. Mm-hmm. Um, let, let's put into like a more like an even more real example. Mm-hmm. Say you are in a practice session and then the other person was putting you on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the analysis process going through in your head? It depends on how they have you on the ground. Like Mm -hmm. if you're just laying on the ground and they are fully on top of you, that's called the mount position because they are just on top of you. It's using their center of gravity when it's off balance. Like if they're leaning too far to one side or the other, you can move your body in a way that pushes them further to that side. Um, if they are in a different position, it's all about knocking them off balance and then almost taking their legs out from under them to kind of reverse it to where now you're on top. Um, and it's, it's mainly if someone's on top of you, it's all about knowing where their weight distribution is and knowing if they are off center and capitalizing on that. Mm-hmm. So for so for example, if without training jujitsu and then someone like punched me and then I was lying on the floor mm-hmm. and the other person was trying to like go on top of me mm-hmm. and the only thought I had in my head would be fuck off. <laughs> but if I am a trained jujitsu practitioner, I would be like, okay, where is his joint? Where is his mm-hmm. thigh? How can I push push him to the side? And how can I do this angle and go through that angle so I can get myself out of the situation and instead put him on the ground instead. Yep. A lot of times in jujitsu, you want to keep your arms and legs in tight to your core. And so you could also look at where their arms are. Are their arms extended out? Because then you can take advantage of that and um, do an arm lock, which is basically just hyperextending their elbow or twisting their shoulder. And so just understanding where their body is in relation to yours and taking advantage of various things. Uh Um. I feel jujitsu is a very intimate sport for me. And honestly, in that workshop, I felt super uncomfortable. I ended up never talking to that coach anymore <laughs> in my life. <laughs> That's one of the things that a lot of people have to overcome because you are in each other's business. Like you are within inches of each other the entire time. And sometimes they are fully on top of you to where you barely have space to breathe. And so that's one of the things that is very difficult for people Mm -hmm. to overcome is understanding that even though you might feel like you are suffocating, like you can't breathe, like you're, you're okay. Because one of the biggest things with jujitsu is and training jujitsu is there's a huge level of trust between you and your training partner. Like if you and I are rolling, which is what we call it in jujitsu. If we're rolling, I'm going to understand that if you tap, which is basically how you say I'm done or that hurts, that submission, you you, you got it, you've successfully got the submission. If you tap, I'm going to let go. And you understand that if I tap, you're going to let go. And so there's this huge amount of trust and it's just this environment that, and again, it comes back to environment. It's this environment that you build that It allows you to think, okay, this person's on top of me and I feel like I can't breathe, but really I'm okay. I can take a second. I can think about it and I can figure out my way out of it. So it's this controlled environment that you both go into mutually understanding that when the other person taps, you're done. Mm -hmm. And so it's controlling your breath. It's controlling your mindset. and Honestly, when you're in the middle of a role, you're more focused on, oh, this person's trying to choke me or, oh, this person's trying to break my arm. They're not really because, again, it's a controlled environment. But, oh, this person's trying to submit me. You don't really have the mental space to think about how 
close in proximity you are. Like you don't really have time to think of how uncomfortable it is that you're in there just very close to them and they like it's just there's no personal space in jujitsu. But when you're in that moment of rolling, you're more focused on your goal of escaping or submitting than you are of, oh, I'm very close to this person. You have other goals. And it's understood that the person you're rolling with isn't trying to do anything inappropriate. Um, obviously, there are situations where that happens in jujitsu gyms, but for the most part, jujitsu gyms are a very positive environment. And it's just you understand the purpose of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I imagine jujitsu community is a need is a community based on high trust and also know how to draw boundaries. Oh yeah, for sure. The relationships you build with your training partners are unmatched. Um, like there are there's so much trust and so much vulnerability because you're constantly putting yourself in a situation where you could lose and you're going to lose jujitsu more than you win jujitsu. So what does that mean? You're going to be the one tapping and the one being submitted more than you're going to win because everyone starts day one not having any idea what to do. And there's going to be people who have been training longer than you that are constantly submitting you and they're going to be winning the match and you're going to lose the match more than you're going to win the match. Um, and whether that be just training in your gym or actually competing in jujitsu competitions, like obviously there are some people who have never lost a match, but they're outliers. For the most part, you're going to lose more than you're going to win. So it's a very humbling sport. It's a very vulnerable sport. And so the relationships that you build with your teammates are just on another level. Mm -hmm. I feel like the community you first tap into will determine a lot of time if you want to continue this sport or not. And I know you just moved to Austin, so mm -hmm. you're looking at different jujitsu gym. And if so if 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 someone tell tell you, hey, I'm actually thinking about trying jujitsu and I want to look. I want to look. Um, trying out different gyms. Mm -hmm. What should I look for to see if this is the community for me or not? Um, kind of just what you would look for in any community. Is everyone else supportive? Do you feel comfortable asking questions when you don't know the answer to something? When you don't know a specific technique, um, are they constantly trying to? build people up or are they constantly making jokes or saying comments like your original coach was um basically just is it a supportive environment um because jujitsu obviously you need another person to do jujitsu i can't roll by myself but it's an individual sport at the same time so it's this weird combination of individual sport but it requires a community and so just finding those supportive environments and encouraging environments and there's going to be like obviously you can make jokes with people and you can just kind of like pick on people but there's a constructive way to do that and a joking way to do that and mm -hmm. then there's a toxic way to do that mm -hmm. i like i like the way you list out the different <laughs> different ways so um I'm curious, what are the differences? How different? Okay, I'm making an assumption here. So tell me if I'm wrong. Do you feel any differences when you are practicing jujitsu versus being a PhD student? Um, it depends what you're referring to. Um, so God, yeah, sorry. Um. Yeah, I'm guessing I'm coming from thinking about my own experiences. Mm -hmm. When I was a corporate worker, I feel powerless. I couldn't really decide what I want to do. Um, so like I'm just like going there and feel my responsibility, earn my paycheck, and go back home. But going back home, I become a powerful female. Like mm -hmm. I decide my life. I decide I want to step into the gym, and I feel powerful after leaving the gym. And I feel like I feel like I own the aliveness that I want to have. And so there was a day and night for me as a corporate employee and a, a lifter. And so I wonder what is that for you as 
a PhD student and a jujitsu or powerlifter. Yeah, I guess that's there for me too, because with academia, the school that you're a part of basically gives you um, restrictions on what you can research, how you can research. They, and like sometimes, uh, a research project you're doing could be funded by a grant and the grant pretty much tells you what you can and can't do and how you can and can't do it. And all of those things are in place for a reason, but it m- kind of makes me feel really restricted because I have to do it the way the school wants me to do it or I have to do it the way that the various points of red tape say I have to do it. And but in a gym, I can go and say, okay, tonight when I go to jujitsu class, I'm going to focus on position. So I'm going to try to get on top and I'm going to try to hold my opponent there. I'm not going to work on submissions. I'm solely going to work us on focus on control today. And I can decide that. And obviously I can't dictate how a role's going to go. It because it's it's all in the moment and it depends on what my opponent's doing, but I can set my own goals for each individual class. And it's the same with lifting. If I go in and I say, well, I was supposed to deadlift today, but my knee's bothering me, so I don't really want to put that pressure on it. I don't really want to deadlift today, so I'll bench instead. I can alter things if I want to, and I can basically just do what feels right in the moment. And I get what you're saying when you say it's empowering and like you feel like when you leave work, you are more empowered. You're an empowered female because you can make more of those decisions for yourself. And um, I think that's often how I feel with any job, (laughs) which I think is why I'm steering more towards the creator world is Mm -hmm. I can do things how I want to do them and not how I'm told I have to do them. So you... Why did you choose to study PhD in criminal justice in the first place? Um, that question goes back to before my PhD. Mm-hmm. So when I was an undergrad, um, when I was getting my bachelor's degree, I was in a relationship where both he and his parents essentially told me I wasn't smart enough to finish college um, because I had said that I wanted to pick up a second major because I started as psychology and I wanted to add criminal justice as a second major. And they, both him and his parents, alluded to the fact that they didn't think I was smart enough to handle that kind of academic rigor and that kind of involved academic program. And so I wanted to prove them wrong, (laughs) even after I ended that relationship. Um, And so I was thinking to myself, again, even after that relationship ended, well, if they thought I couldn't even finish the first four years of college, I'm going to show them I'm going to get my master's degree. And then when I got my master's degree, it was like, okay, well, if I can do that and my mentors in my master's program think that. I'm a good academic student and I'm a good researcher. I'm going to go get my PhD. So I didn't necessarily start grad school for the right reasons. I started it as kind of an I'll show them and and I didn't really do it for myself. I did it because I wanted to prove a point. Um, But that kind of helped expose me to the things that I realized that I really like doing. I really like doing research. I really like organization and helping other people. And so grad school taught me skills that I will use forever, but I didn't necessarily start grad school for the right reasons. Um, Now, if you're asking why I specifically chose criminal justice, um, again, I started as a psychology student, and as part of the core curriculum, I had to take either intro to criminal justice, intro to corrections, or intro to law. I wasn't interested in law. I didn't really know anything about intro to corrections like jails and prisons. But I was like, okay, so I'll take intro to criminal justice and just fill that requirement, no problem. Um, the class was taught by a fantastic professor. And he just made it seem like the most interesting topic in the world. 
And very soon after I made it my minor and then eventually made it my second major. And then when I went on to grad school, I wanted to focus more on the criminal justice than the psychology. So I kept going down that route. Mm -hmm. And when you are working at when you are studying your PhD, you also work at work at a, sh- a domestic violence shoulder. I worked at the shelter before, like in between my bachelor's、okay. and my master's program. So when I finished my bachelor's degrees in 2014, and then I worked at a youth correctional facility for about a year, and then I transitioned to a part-time role at the domestic violence shelter, and then eventually that moved into a full-time position there. And I worked at the shelter for a About three years, I think, before we moved、um, away from West Virginia because we lived in West Virginia at the time, and we moved to Tennessee so Corey could do his internship for his schooling. And when we moved to Tennessee is when I decided to go back to grad school and get my master's. And so、mm-hmm. I got my master's in Tennessee, and then we moved to Kentucky for my PhD.、Mm-hmm. Um, you so when we were chatting, maybe last year or this year earlier. Um, you said one of the things that you might want to consider doing is help helping companies、um, getting more educated on、mm-hmm. how to help their employees getting out of domestic violence、mm-hmm. or even spotting which employees is suffering from domestic violence. Could you talk more about that? Yeah.、Um, so workplace violence and employees experiencing domestic violence is a really big deal because one of the Most common tactics that an abuser will use is keeping their partner from working or not allowing their partner to work. So they might hide the car keys so their partner can't leave for work on time, which then risks them getting fired or in trouble. And so, just helping companies understand that not only is domestic violence an issue, but a lot of times abusers will use employment. As a control tactic, so even if someone is experiencing a domestic violence situation, if they decide to report it to police or if they decide to file a protective order, that means that they have to go to court. And court only happens Monday through Friday during business hours. Court cases don't take place on the weekends or in the evenings. So they might have to miss work to attend those court sessions, and if they don't show up to those court hearings, the judge throws out the protective order. So they have to show up; they have to be there. So if a company has a policy where you only have a limited number of personal time that you can take off, if that person's already used that personal time, if they have to make a decision, then they have to choose go to court and fight for my safety. And risk losing my job because I've used all of my personal time already, or stay at work so I don't lose my job, but that means not going to court, and then I lose the protective order. So just helping companies understand that sometimes that strict of a time off policy is an obstacle that domestic violence victims shouldn't have to face. They shouldn't have to worry about deciding between their safety and their job.、Mm-hmm. Oh man, I didn't. I never could have imagined there are such logistic involved in in claiming your own autonomy again.、Mm-hmm. How say say you're HR in your company、mm-hmm. or a CEO or at a higher level? How do you help? How do you how can you spot if one of your employees suffering from domestic violence? Um, there are a couple of ways. So a lot of missed work with. Loose or inconsistent reasoning behind them,、uh, behind their called time off. So if they're calling in and saying they're sick all the time, they might actually be sick, or there might be something else going on.、Um, if they're showing up to work with bruises in random places, sometimes that one's not always as easy to see because an abuser will also tend to. Be physically violent in a way that only leaves marks in places that would be easily covered with clothing.、Um, so sometimes that's a little harder to notice. If they make comments like, "Oh, well, I have to check with my partner," some like obviously, if I said, "Hey, Angie, do you want to go grab dinner tonight?" You're gonna probably say, "Let me check with 
Paul to make sure we don't have any plans or anything like that makes sense. That's normal. But if it's constantly happening and if it's, oh, well, my partner has to come along with us. I can't go without them if they're basically not allowed to go anywhere by themselves. That's a little bit easier to pick up on. Um, And just how they act, how they talk about their partner. And sometimes HR might have an advantage over other positions in the company to see those things. Because if the if their if that employee's paycheck is going to a bank account that is not necessarily theirs like sometimes an abuser will make somebody hand over their paycheck to them and they don't have like the victim doesn't have a bank account in their name hr might be able to spot that they might be able to i don't know what information they have offhand about the bank account that a paycheck gets direct deposited into but they're closer to being able to identify that than anybody else in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you, your discussion made me re- a memory just like surface up in my head. When I was in elementary school, mm-hmm. I have a classmate, uh, a female classmate, a girl who always wear very very long socks to school, mm-hmm. and like our teacher gave her public warnings a few times, and she still keep wearing long socks to school and. Kids started to make fun of her. So, oh, you're trying to be like prettier than us and stuff. And our teacher one day just gets so mad and just have her taking off her socks and then come back to the come back to the classroom. And then she came back with her legs full of scars. Mm-hmm. And we were we were a bit shocked and feel bad for her, but we weren't really we didn't really care that much because when I grew up, physical punishment inside houses is still something that is acceptable. Mm-hmm. Uh, even now in I, I believe in many households in Taiwan, physical punishment is still mm-hmm. pretty common, and think of think of it as something we did it for the good for the ki- of the kids. And so, but now, like these days, like just now, when you describe it, I was like, oh, holy shit, she was suffering from domestic violence because mm-hmm. those those many scars are not it's definitely not acceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just looking for those things, like. Normally, you can kind of get a gut feeling like you're like, oh, well, that's abnormal or it's not like it's 80 degrees outside. Why are they wearing long sleeves and a scarf all the time? Um, So just thinking of those little things. And a lot of times what happens is people will run into the issue. um, We call it the bystander effect in kind of my field where if we see something happening, we think, oh, someone else is going to handle that. Someone else will do something about it. So I shouldn't. That's not my place. And while addressing domestic violence with somebody is a very delicate process um, because their safety is involved, Mm -hmm. it's still something where we shouldn't necessarily think, oh, well, that's not my place to say something or someone else will handle it. If you suspect something, then there are ways that you can try to figure out how to address it and how to make it apparent that you are someone they can turn to for help. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I want to ask you more about the bystander effect Mm -hmm. and how to deal with that. So for example, after study and living in the States for so many years, a lot of the things that is considered common or acceptable in Taiwan is unacceptable for, for me. And when I went back to Taiwan last year for a few years ago, for example, there we, we live in a we live in an apartment complex where in Taiwan is you can basically hear whatever is going on in everyone's mm-hmm. neighbor in everyone's household. And there is this famous household, which around, according to my mom, around 4 or 5 p.m., you will start to hear the mom screaming and the kids crying and then a lot of things being thrown around mm-hmm. and then just shouting and stuff. And at first I was like, oh, okay, that's coming in Taiwan. But then when I was really physically there, I was like, holy shit, this, the kids, I cannot imagine mm-hmm. what type of fight they went through. So as I was about to take the, you know, like the the call where you can call the front desk of the community mm-hmm. so they can involve, like get involved. My mom said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And I said, wait, what if I really, okay, what if I call the police? What if I tell 
the the front desk of our the, like the office of our community, mm-hmm. and then they they get involved, and then after after they left, the kids get hard get hit even harder. Mm-hmm. So I ended up didn't do anything, and I feel so bad for myself and for the kids. What do you think is a better way to handle this? And that's the trickiness of the situation most of the time is so the most dangerous part for the most dangerous point in an abusive relationship is when the abused victim tries to leave or when intervention tries to happen. So sometimes when police are called, like you said, when police leave, it can be more violent and more deadly. And when the victim tries to leave their abuser, if their abuser manages to get them back, oftentimes that's a lot more dangerous for them because the abuser feels like they're losing the control that they worked so hard to maintain. And so I can't give any blanket advice that in every situation, this is what you should do because every situation is unique. And the only expert in each situation is the victim that's experiencing the abuse. They're the only one that knows exactly what's going on, that knows exactly how their abuser will respond, and exactly what the safest option would be. It might be safest for that person to stay, and maybe it's not safe for them to try anything in the evening because their abuser's home, but maybe they have a better chance at leaving safely during the day because their abuser's at work. So, It's really hard to answer that question, and I can't really give a good answer because each situation is different. Um, But one thing people can do is call their – anybody can call their local domestic violence shelter and just say, hey, I have this neighbor and this is what's going on. What are some things that I can do? How can I help? And so that way – you're 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 gaining information and you're figuring out what to do and but you're not necessarily involving the victim just yet. So if I hear that my neighbor is there's constant fighting like you said things are being thrown across the room, I'm hearing kids crying whatever, I could call a local shelter here and say, "Hey, um I'm pretty sure my neighbor's experiencing domestic violence. I'm pretty sure her partner's abusing her. There are kids in the house. This is what I heard. What are some things that I can do? How can I help her or him and keep them safe? So that's probably my number one piece of advice, and that's the thing that everyone can do that would definitely help limit the amount of potential danger towards the victim is not even involve them at first and call the, I wouldn't say call the local police because if the police are called, then they might have to come out. Like they might be required to come out and investigate, but you can call your local domestic violence shelter and ask them for advice because they are not required to report it. Now they might be required to report it if there are kids involved, because a lot of times abuse around children requires mandated reporting. But for the most part, you can call your local domestic violence shelter and get some answers there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if it's physically abusive or verbally, just emotionally abusive. A lot of your writings in your newsletter talk about this Mm -hmm. in your previous abusive relationship. And you also just talk about the crazy things that your ex-boyfriend, your ex-boyfriend's mom say to you. could you share what happened in the in the degree that you feel comfortable mm-hmm. with? Yeah. So um, when I was 15, right before I turned 16, I started dating this kid that um, I went to school with. And I thought he was the greatest person in the world. I thought he was extremely loving. Um, his parents were very supportive of me and what I wanted to do. They were very friendly. Um, but then slowly i didn't even really realize what was going on until 5 years into the relationship so i was with him throughout high school i was with him through part of college my mom and my brother had told me repeatedly throughout those 5 years that it wasn't a healthy relationship that he was too controlling but you're not going to listen to the people that are closest to you especially when it's your mom um telling you that you shouldn't date somebody <laughs> so mm-hmm. i ignored them And um, 
that relationship was not physically abusive. It was just controlling and um, emotionally abusive. Like at one point I expressed that I wanted to get my PhD in psychology. I wanted to be a child psychologist. And his first response was, well, I guess I'll have to get a PhD in something because I can't have you have a higher degree than me. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> that's pretty straightforwardly <laughs> craziness. Um, and so just things like that telling me like, oh, just and, and saying it in a way that like it wasn't overtly controlling, like, oh, you look prettier with your hair straight or you look prettier with long hair or when you have makeup on or you look prettier when you don't wear sweatpants because sweatpants are sloppy. So every day I straightened my hair, I put a full face of makeup on and I wore nice clothes. And I was told who I couldn't couldn't hang out with, basically. Um, I even left. So my grandmother passed away when I was a freshman in college. And I flew back home to go to her funeral. And he drove in from where he was going to school so he could go to the funeral as well. And I even left my grandmother's funeral early because... He wanted me to go to dinner with his parents while we were in town before we went back to school. So I left my family at my grandmother's funeral to spend time with him and his family. And at the time, I didn't realize that that wasn't okay. And I thought it was fine and I didn't see a problem with it. But now that's probably one of the things that still bothers me the most is that I basically abandoned my family in that time of need. Um, And then... Finally, he was studying abroad for a semester in college, and he would FaceTime me on our phones at random times of day so that he could make sure that I was where I said I was or where I was supposed to be depending on my schedule. Was I at work? Was I in my dorm room when I said I was in my dorm room? Was I in the library when I said I was in the library? And finally, my boss at the time, her... um she was phenomenal <laughs> because even though my mom and my brother told me throughout that whole relationship that it wasn't acceptable, she sat me down in her office one day and said, this is not okay. This is not a healthy relationship. You need to leave my office, go to your dorm room, call him, end the relationship right now. No ifs, ands, or buts. He's over in Europe, so this is the safest time for you to do it. Come back to my office when you are done. I leave here at four. Come back to my office and tell me you ended it. Tell me you broke up with him and we'll go from there. So she basically told me I had to. <laughs> and just the fact that she was somebody who didn't really have a reason to do that. Like she wasn't emotionally invested in me. She wasn't a family member. She was a close friend. But she wasn't a family member. So the fact that she was taking the time to sit down with me and tell me that this isn't okay and that I needed to end the relationship, it was kind of that light bulb like, oh, crap, this she's right. Um, and so I ended the relationship. But very soon after, I ended up in another relationship with somebody who I thought was better. Uh, I thought he was more loving, more caring, um, more healthy of a relationship. Um, thankfully I was only in that relationship for a year because he ended up being a lot worse than the first partner. Um, if I would have stayed in the second relationship much longer, it probably would have gotten physically violent. Um, in, in that relationship, there was a lot of gaslighting, which is basically making you think <laughs> you're going crazy. Um, making you doubt yourself, making you question what you said or what happened. And there was a lot of gaslighting going on. and. Finally, there was one night where I asked him if he was cheating on me because I had pretty good evidence that he was. And he basically turned it around on me and accused me of being crazy and of cheating on him. And he ended up punching a hole, like a dent in the refrigerator or the wall or something in the kitchen next to me. And that was kind of like the I'm in the same, if not worse, situation as I was. So I kind of ended that relationship. I ended up going back to him a few times a little bit, but I moved out of that house, moved in to my own apartment, 
and started working on myself. I got a dog and it was just starting to rebuild myself, basically. Thank you for sharing your story. I think a lot of us who are who were in an abusive relationship at the moment is really hard to realize that no matter what people told us. And I, I have a couple of experiences as well before I met my husband. And I remember like in those abusive relationships, it's like I am holding on to a life raft. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that that person is the only person who understand my aspiration and dreams. They are the only only person who who see me differently. Like they see maybe the side of me that other people didn't see. And mm -hmm. so that's why they love love me more and wanted to help me more. And now that I look back, like <laughs> how stupid I was. So there's well, that's one thing. That's what they want uh -huh. you to think. They want you to think that they are the only person that can love you. They want you to think that they are the only person that fully understands you. Or how so, lucky you are to be exactly. loved by me. Exactly. I have one example that I, it's like the after effect of that relationship and I still carry on. And every time I think about it, it's just like creeping out. So I remember one day I was seeing this guy who I, who I was so madly in love with. Mm -hmm. And now now that I look back, I know it's a, it's a very huge uh, relationship. It's a relationship based on huge attachment. Mm -hmm. And I was so attached to attach my self-worth, my meaning to his love that I will do whatever I can to not have him break up with me. And I remember I was staying in his apartment and I showered and I came I, I went back to the room and then he used the shower and then he came back. He was he was he looked he was this kind and all smiley and now like he came back and then he just looked at me straight in the eyes with a very angry face. And then he said to me, Who the fuck do you think you are that you can leave hair in my bathroom? Like no one ever teach you how to be how to be a clean person. And instead of instead of feeling weird that he has such a huge emotional flip on me and over such I consider as a small thing, mm -hmm. even though I'm not the cleanest person. <laughs> and I I didn't like get angry or what and I say, Oh, thank you for thank you for telling me. And then from that angry face, immediately turn into a smiley face again. Oh, the way you frame you frame this, um, the way you react to my word, just show me, um, just show me what type of person you mm -hmm. are. And I will say, oh, I win her love again. Mm -hmm. And so every single time, no matter where I go, after I shower, even now, after I shower, I will kneel on the floor, try to pick every hair I have I can find. And I know <laughs> it's probably a good thing. It's probably a respectful guest behavior, but it's definitely rooted from mm -hmm. that super abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to Corey yesterday about how um, both of those relationships were over 10 years ago at this point, but I still have realizations every now and then. Like um, I was writing my newsletter issue that went out this morning and I was talking about lasting effects from those relationships. And without even thinking, one of the things I typed was in social situations, I tend to only speak when spoken to. I won't be the one to initiate conversation. And I was like, holy shit, that's from those relationships because it was a problem when I spoke up and it was a problem when I voiced my opinions and when I spoke first. Like, Obviously, like he didn't tell me those past relationships. They didn't tell me you can only spoke when you're spoken to. But just the constant belittling and the constant like nature of them putting me down made that to where that's what ended up happening was I would really only spoke speak when I was spoken to. And even over 10 years later, sometimes I'll still do that in a social situation, even if it's around people that I'm semi comfortable with that I've talked to before. If I would walk into the jujitsu, if I would walk into the jujitsu gym and see people on the mats that I know, I physically could not say hello first. Like the words would not come out of my mouth and I would just walk right by them. But if they said hi to me, I'd be like, oh, hey, how you doing? How have you been? And talk like it's no problem. But sometimes if I'm the one that has to speak first, it, it just it's like there's a brick wall and those words might, won't come out. And I didn't really make the connection that that's rooted in those relationships. Now that I'm aware of it, now that I made that connection the other day, I am going to be more conscious about kind of fixing that and correcting it. 
and trying to be a little bit more outspoken. But again, that was over a decade ago and I'm still making new realizations and making new connections. Mm -hmm. It's funny, before this interview started, we were talking about, hey, we show, we should talk about abusive relationship today. And then my husband, Paul, was like, it's so easy to be a loving husband. I just need to be a proper human being. Mm-hmm. And you think I'm awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really true. And especially, I rem- like, I've been so used to his awesomeness that I mostly forgot how awesome he was. But mm-hmm. I remember the first year we were dating, I was so shocked by how nice a man can be. Mm-hmm. And before I met Paul, I, like, um, I really had this dream of being a digital nomad, but I didn't know. I mean, I kind of know how to because I read Tim, Tim Ferriss for our work week. But mm-hmm. the first time I really met a digital nomad in person is also on dating app. And so I started dating this guy who has been nomad for a while. And I didn't, I didn't realize he was being abusive at that time. And he was like, oh, you want to be, you want to be a digital nomad? Let me help you. Give me your resume and I can walk you through it. And then, during our appointment, like say, hey, we meet at a coffee shop, and at this time, at this point of time, and I walk into the coffee shop and I, I sit down at the same table. He will not look at me. He will only he will keep working on his computer until mm-hmm. maybe 30, 40 minutes, minutes later, and then lift her head up and then say, "What's up?" And I was like, "What is going on?" So for, for the first few times, it was like maybe I'm just being too, you know, sensitive. Mm-hmm. And then later, I would just say, "This guy was." I feel like I'm not being treated properly. Mm-hmm. Like, why is my existence not a co- not acknowledged? And then I started to bring this up, and he was like, "Oh, you're being too sensitive and stuff." And I was like, "No, I think that there are a lot of other evidence that you're not treating mm-hmm. me right." And then he started to bring it up. Oh, I think we should base our relationship on love and trust. And then the way you're behaving, just tell me that you're not loving and all that. Maybe you're not smart, and smart enough to be a digital nomad. And I read that. I was like, "Fuck you." <laughs> But of Those course, they're not related. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? Like, I'm not. I'm pretty sure I'm a smart person. So mm-hmm. when he started to say crazy things like that, I started to be like, okay, maybe it's time to end this dating relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy I wasn't in a super serious relationship with him. Mm-hmm. But still, I, I, I try a few attempts, another few attempts before I really just like say, okay, I stop texting me. I'm deleting mm-hmm. you from my all, all my social media that this is the end. Mm-hmm. And I remember the day after I delete him from all the possible connection I have, he uses another account to message me with a picture of her a, a girl that she's date, he's dating. Mm-hmm. He said, hey, he went to the gym that I usually work out with, which I wasn't happened to be at the gym at that time. He said, hey, I went to the gym with her today. Didn't see you there. I was like, oh my trying God. Trying to make you jealous. <laughs> this guy just batshit crazy. I'm so <laughs> glad that we are not dating anymore. Mm-hmm. And and I remember when I started dating Paul and then he started to build his, strat- his strategy consulting mm-hmm. course. And I opened the door and he was, su- he, the way he worked is super intense. Mm-hmm. It's like, if he's in the flow, he can he cannot hear anything. He could not hear anything. I opened the door and he looked at me. He immediately, immediately flipped his computer and then, I mean, like shut his computer down and then come hug me and ask me, how am I doing? And I was like, wait, so this is normal. <laughs> like, this is actually normal. Like, I wasn't crazy. And I remember there was another day where we went um, on a trip and in the morning, I I I wanted to go out for a walk, but mm-hmm. I was so afraid that he would be mad at me because I wasn't allowed to go on a walk by myself mm-hmm. when I was dating another guy, and I was just so afraid that Paul would break up with me. And but I really like going on a walk. I feel like this is gonna be a spiritual awakening for me. We were in the mountain, so I just I like very very carefully with the preparation that she, he might break up with me and mm-hmm. say, "Hey, um, do you mind if I go on a walk by myself?" And he was like, "Why are you asking me? Just go." And then I was like, I just, I literally cried at that moment. I think it's with those countries that I realized how, uh, what type of abuse relationship mm-hmm. I was in before. But man, it's really hard to realize when you are in an abu- abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. So like now as someone who moved past those experiences, how, what do you think, what, like, how would you tell people who are suspicious they are in an abusive relationship to to find clues to spot the fact that they're actually in one? Um, honestly, it's similar to what I was saying about finding a gym. <laughs> 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 it's it's all about your environment. If you ever feel unsafe, if you ever feel like you're being 
doubted or punished or if you ever feel like you're not being supported by your partner, um, then it's questionable. Then there, I'm not saying that every situation is going to be abusive, but it might be that there's some things you need to look at and there's some things that you need to start paying attention to. And if it's, it's okay if relationships don't work out. <laughs> like, obviously, we want our current relationships to work, but it's normal for people to grow apart. What's not normal and what's not okay is to stay with somebody that you're not 100% supported by. And obviously, if I say, hey, Corey, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to quit everything in life. I'm going to sell my belongings and I'm going to go to Europe and I'm going by myself. You're going to stay here and I'm just going to go on a backpacking trip solo. He'd be like, okay, that's cool. Kind of sucks because I don't want to do long distance. We did long distance for a year, but if that's what you want to do, then you go do it. Does that mean that we would stay together? I don't know. I don't know what that would look like but we would try to make it work. But he would never say, no, you can't. He would never try to tell me what I can and can't do. And that's obviously I'm not going to quit everything and go backpack through Europe by myself. I would want him to go with me. But that's just an example that he wouldn't tell me I can't do it. He wouldn't tell me that I can't go hang out with Angie and get coffee with her. Um, so just realizing that if your partner isn't supporting your goals and your dreams, even if your goals and your dreams change, then maybe there's something going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will, I will say like really trust your gut. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there are many small moments that I feel like maybe the way I was treated was not right. But I choose to blindly believe in the side of the relationship that I want to believe in because I was so desperate to want to have that type of image of myself. And mm -hmm. if I break up, then that perfect image of myself would never exist anymore. So how I like to look at it and is your personal safety and well-being comes above all else. So if there's ever a point in your relationship or in your environment, and this goes for anything, right? It's not just your relationship with your intimate partner, but it could be a relationship with a family member or relationships with friends or a workplace environment. It's basically anything that you're involved in with life. If there's ever a point where you feel like your safety is being put at risk, then move on from that thing, move away from that thing. Um, there's a... Um, an author named Gavin DeBecker, and he owns this huge security firm, and he wrote a book called The Gift of Fear. And he does a really good job of highlighting how you should pay attention to your gut feelings. And he said something in a podcast interview that I listened to not too long ago, where he basically said, other people's feelings aren't worth your safety, is what I got out of it. So if I, as a female, if I'm waiting for an elevator, by myself and the elevator door opens and there's somebody already on the elevator that I get a bad feeling about. Basically, society almost teaches us that we should push that feeling down and get on the elevator anyways because we might hurt the person's feeling if we say, I'll wait for the next one. That person's feelings mean nothing compared to my personal safety. So Gavin DeBecker talks about how you shouldn't get on an elevator, which is basically a soundproof steel box with someone that you get a bad feeling with just because you might hurt their feelings if you say, mm -hmm. I'll wait for the next one. So just keeping that in mind that your personal safety and your personal well-being and your happiness comes above all else. Mm -hmm. um, aside from like on the safety level, I, I don't know if you have the same feeling. I feel like I couldn't, I'm getting better at saying no mm -hmm. and setting boundary. And it's because I'm currently in a relationship with my husband where I feel safe after so many times of being afraid to say no, say no and losing the relationship and then turning out the other person was always rooting for us and happy for us and cheering for us that I realized saying no is, um, 
I realized I have the right, I have the autonomy mm-hmm. to decide on things in the way I wanted. And growing up in the Asian culture, it's like impossible to set boundary. Um, especially like all sorts of emotional or like physical abuse is just so casual. Mm-hmm. Um, so casual in Taiwan, the way I grew up. And I think that's maybe maybe how I rationalized those abusive relationships mm-hmm. because I was treated treated like this by my parents anyway. And it's only like with with Paul that I realized this is not okay to treat someone or being treated like that. And it's okay to say no and set boundaries with other people. And yeah, I I don't I don't have a and after this. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, like setting and maintaining personal boundaries is something that those relationships really helped me build and create because like you, like I basically did whatever they wanted me to and whatever they told me to do. So I didn't have those personal boundaries. I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know how to say, well, I don't like that or I don't want that or I'd rather do this instead. And it took a while, kind of like how you said when Paul got up and hugged you, you cried and you when um he said you like don't have to ask to go on a walk like those were things that i experienced too and it's kind of weird how we had very similar situations like i would constantly ask Corey, is it okay if i go hang out with my friends or is it okay if i do this or do you like this shirt before i buy it and he'd say i don't care do what you want like mm-hmm. it's fine wear what you want cut all your hair off i don't care um that that's hard it was almost jarring to experience because it wasn't what I was used to. But having those more positive experiences with Corey has really helped me be like, okay, well, I can make my own decisions. Like, I don't have to ask anybody's permission. And like, obviously, me making the decision to leave academia and not, well, not leave academia because I'm still going to finish my degree, but not following the traditional path of working at a university and pivoting instead to online creator and writer and digital artist. Like, obviously, those were conversations I had with Corey, and he helped me realize that that's what I wanted. But it wasn't like a, I need to ask his permission before I make this decision. It was a, hey, I'm thinking about this. What are your thoughts? What will this look like? And how do I do it? Because he's an online creator, so he's already Mm -hmm. done it. Um, so almost using him as like a guide kind of, Mm -hmm. but like, I never felt like I had to ask his permission. I was never afraid of what he would say. Like I knew he'd be on board because I was just changing goals. It wasn't like I was saying, well, I don't want to do that anymore and I don't want to do anything. It was, I want to do this instead. And he was right on board from the start. So just that complete 180 of experiences has helped me like you said, gain that autonomy and gain that realization that I can make my own decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think when I, after I realized how good or how, what was a normal relationship should be, I think that for a while I was very mad at my previous self and feel sad that I was allowing myself to, to let people treat me like that. But I think, I think eventually I get past that. And now I'm in the stage where, where I feel like it's, yeah, of course, this is the way you should be treated. You should be loved and you should be supported unconditionally. And right now I have the same thing. Like um, if I ask Paul for something and then he give me opinion, he could give me some mm-hmm. advice and I'll be like, oh, okay, that's fine. I think I'm just I'm gonna still going to do it my way. Like I feel so, it's, it's funny and it's kind of annoying to mm-hmm. him, but I feel like just show how much progress I've made. I, I'm not afraid of saying no to something just because I'm so afraid of losing the relationship because I know whatever I may, he's not going to me- leave me mm-hmm. and he loves me unconditionally. Mm-hmm. I completely understand that. Like my sometimes my level of independence <laughs> is problematic and gives me obstacles that are unnecessary simply because I don't want to ask for help because I want to keep that independence and Corey will just sit back and watch me struggle and then he'll be like are you ready for some help yet like are you are you ready to let me help you <laughs> so, oh so last last week so Paul was like I'm thinking about having someone hiring someone to help me do 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 like a video clips mm-hmm. and so I started to like secretly researching for like how how to like what's the best video mm-hmm. trans transcription app and stuff and I was like trying to help him without him knowing it and so I was like just casually asking 
um, so like, where do you usually save all your video <laughs> clips? And then he was like, why are you asking? He was like, oh, nothing. I'm just like curious, you know. And then in the end, I gave up. I tell him, and then he was like, you know, you can just ask me for help. Like, I can, I can teach you in 10 minutes. You don't have to figure it out yourself, right? But And I was so angry. I was like, I just want to figure out myself. I just don't want your help. But still, I learned from him, bitch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. So you've been writing a newsletter for more than 40 issues. Mm -hmm. What was it like? writing at the very beginning as compared to writing now um well Corey had been telling me that i should write online for a long time way longer than i was on board for um because i still have those moments of self-doubt where i don't think i'm good enough or i don't think i have enough important things to say so i was like no i'm later like when we get more settled in a house when we move next time because my computer setup isn't ideal right now or when i'm done with school i was always coming up with a let's wait kind of situation but then finally i was like all right well i'll go on substack and i'll make an account and i'll at least get that started but i guess part of the process of making an account on substack is like one of the steps is to publish your first issue and so i was going through making the account i had signed up and then was like all right time to write your first post and i was like oh <laughs> well i guess we're starting today <laughs> um, and so thankfully, I have Corey because he's an online creator and he's a psychologist. So it's really easy for me to bounce ideas off of him. Um, I don't know that I would be as willing to dive into this creator space if it weren't for him also being a creator, because sometimes the unknown scares me and keeps me from doing things. But so... I just started writing once a week and writing about things that have helped me be feel more empowered, whether that be jujitsu or honestly, stoicism really helped me a lot and mindfulness and other things like those. And basically just what I'm thinking about in that current moment, what I'm trying to work through, what I'm trying to process or what has helped me in the past. Because with those abusive relationships, I want to be the person that I didn't have. I want to be the support. I want to be the person that helps other people who are in those situations realize they're in those situations before it's too late or before they're in them for too long. So basically, I want to be the person that I needed most when I was in those relationships. And I think writing online basically it goes back to being able to do things how I want to do them and helping as many people as I can because in academia I can do all of the research on domestic violence and sexual assault and dating violence and all of these things but anything that gets published is going to be behind the paywall of an academic journal so people would have to pay to read that research people would have to pay to see how what I'm researching can be applied. And some people aren't comfortable reaching out to domestic violence shelters. Some people can't stay at domestic violence shelters for one reason or another. So I want to write and put things out into the world so that I can help as many people as possible. Because the people, I mean, domestic violence can affect anybody of any socioeconomic status, of any cultural background, of any gender, whatever. But it disproportionately affects people who are in poverty and who are of lower socioeconomic status. So these are the people that aren't going to pay to read an academic journal. They're not going to be able to buy a book at a bookstore necessarily because they're worried about finding their next meal or feeding their kids or finding a place to live. So if I can put free content out into the world that can potentially help people that were in similar situations that I was in, especially teenagers, then my job's done. Because I mean, even with teenagers, like they're just learning how to date. They don't know what a healthy relationship means. A lot of times it's really easy to confuse relationships that are control or behaviors that are controlling as relationships that are caring and loving. Um, and so just helping teenagers understand that and learn the difference between a healthy relationship and an abusive relationship um, really already helps me. Like it, That's my goal is to get that information out into mm -hmm. the world. You share in one of our 
breakout room in on Zoom that your long term goal can I share that? Absolutely. Your long term <laughs> goals are a book、mm-hmm. for adults and a children's book.、Mm-hmm. Do more. Talk more about them. Yeah. So、um, the book for adults that I would love to write is basically it's a working title, but what keeps coming to head in my mind is basically the ultimate guide to understanding domestic violence. So just it's a very nuanced thing and a very, like I said, individualized thing to experience. So if I can put as much information into one space, and obviously that would be something that like. Would be in a bookstore, or people would buy, but I'm not going to make it like it, it'd still be accessible to the general public.、Um, but that one is a little bit further down the line. the The first thing that I want to work on is a children's book, and on one of our many drives from Kentucky to Texas, in the process of the move, Corey and I were talking through this idea, and basically, so when I worked at the domestic violence shelter. The main job of everybody else was to make sure that the adult residents in the shelter had all of their needs met. My job, I was the youth services coordinator. My job was to make sure that any kids that came to the shelter with those adults had their needs met. So I would help the parents enroll their kids in school if they had to change schools. I would help them make sure. They had food stamps for their kids and had a car seat if they needed it. And I would work on cultivating all of these relationships with these community organizations that were focused on kids. And then within the shelter, I would ask the kids how their day is going, how school was. I would build relationships with the kids, just because their entire lives got changed. Like they. Don't necessarily understand why they can't go home anymore. Why the police were at their house, and now they're in the shelter under a roof with complete strangers in the next room, and why they can't see their other parent anymore. And it's really hard for the parent that experienced domestic violence to explain that because they're trying to process it themselves. So, I would love to write a children's book that basically explains. Why they can't go home anymore? What's going on? And frame it in a way that it seems really crappy right now, and it seems like your world is ending right now, and like it's the worst thing you could ever experience. But really, it's the first step to a more positive life and a happier life and a safer life. And whether it be something that a child can read on their own, or something that the parent could read to their child, and let it be a conversation starter. Between that parent and their kid, so that they can better understand what's going on, and not feel as lost. Because a lot of times, kids will think that they did something wrong, and it's their fault that、mm-hmm. they are at the shelter and that they can't go home anymore. But、um, ideally, this book would be the thing that helps them realize that everything's going to be okay. We are very looking forward to reading the books, Rochelle. It'll it'll be a minute before they're out, but I'm working on it. <laughs> so now you've moved to Austin. What are your dreams and hopes for your recently newly started life? Oh, so many.、Um, obviously, just keep creating, keep writing online, putting out resources,、um, sharing my knowledge both personally and professionally,、um, and. Just helping as many people as I can.、Um, like you said in my intro, my main goal is to just advocate for people and help people who can't do those things for themselves.、Um, so being their voice, being their guiding light—that's really all I want to do. And I don't know what all that will look like. There's definitely things on the horizon that.、Um, I'm still exploring and trying to figure out how I want to do it, but I'm really excited to figure it out, and we'll see what happens.、Mm-hmm. In addition to the things we chatted about today,、uh, writings and then his、uh, her experiences on domestic violence prevention, Rusho is also an amazing digital artist. She she has amazing stickers, and then you can also check out her portfolio in our show notes. And thank you so much, Rachel, for our conversations today. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Bye-bye.